Welcome, I'm Peter Winch, and here in the, with the virtual table of panelists, uh, we have uh, Bob McLean and Dr. Katrina Caldwell and Lizzie Grabowski, and we're waiting for our keynote speaker uh, to, to join us. Um, this is our, we're, we're very happy to have you here for our second uh, annual virtual symposium. This is our agenda uh, today. Um, in a minute, uh, Dr. Caldwell will be introducing Dr. Carolyn Finney. Um, she'll give her uh, keynote address and we'll have responses to that. Then we're going to have an update on the J2 sustainability plan starting at 1025. At 1105, there will be a brief break and then the, uh, after the break, the remainder of the session today is um, discussions and presentations on environmental justice, starting with an update on what the SLC is, is doing on environmental justice, and then hearing from other groups at the university and how they're engaging in these issues. Um, the goals for this morning are to ensure a shared understanding of environmental justice, establish transparency about the GHU sustainability plan process, and that will be in the following session. Um, and then in the final session, we're going to review recent and current projects of GHU affiliates and also the SLC um, that address environmental justice. And finally, we're gonna provide a forum for critical thought and collective discussion on the intersection of sustainability and social justice. And so with that, I'm going to pass the virtual baton to my co-chair on the Sustainability Leadership Council, Bob McLean. All right, well, good morning, everybody. And let me add my welcome again. I'm Bob McLean, Vice President for Facilities and Real Estate and, and work with Peter on the Sustainability Leadership Council. I just really appreciate you joining us today. Um, maybe a little bit of rain might help keep us indoors, but, but I, I do appreciate everybody participating. Uh, before we go too much further, I do want to do a little bit of a shout out to, to Lizzie Grabowski. She is uh, a wonder woman in, in many respects, uh, but her organizing this symposium, these events, and uh, helping manage us um, is a difficult task. And so I appreciate all that she does. So just a shout out to Lizzie for, for all your help. Um, I'm really pleased today to, to introduce Dr. Katrina Caldwell. Um, she is going to help introduce our keynote speaker and also participate in our Q&A panel. Um, Katrina, Dr. Caldwell is our Chief Diversity Officer. Uh, previously, she's held a, a range of similar positions at a number of higher educational institutions, and most recently uh, as the first University of Mississippi Vice Chancellor for Diversity and Community Engagement. I've worked with her on a number of issues, and um, I really enjoy um, the engagement and the participation and collaboration on, on so many fronts, just really the thoughtful approach she brings to everything. Uh, so I'm grateful uh, you are with us today, uh, Katrina. So thank you. Thank you so much, Bob, for that warm introduction. And I've also enjoyed our opportunities to work together, um, which makes this event um, particularly significant in that um, having the Chief Diversity Officer kick off a Sustainability Leadership Council Symposium conversation speaks to um, not only the work of our speaker, but the importance of seeing the close connections to those. And so it is meaningful that my first engagement, maybe three days after arriving, was with your office. Uh, so talking about these issues um, speaks volumes to the opportunities that are before us. I have the awesome pleasure of introducing our speaker to you. Um, I don't, I try not to use the word fangirl often in these types of moments, but um, just um, reading her book, um, getting to know more about her, looking at her TED Talks, um, I, I promise you what you're going to see in the next couple of minutes will be inspiring and thought provoking and will complicate your notions of this work and um, they'll also force you to think um, I've had many calls with my mom after reading books about my own history as it relates to this space and my own perceptions of my relationship with the quote unquote great outdoors. But with no further ado, I want to introduce Dr. Carolyn Finney. 
She's a storyteller, author, and a cultural geographer who is deeply interested in issues related to identity, difference, creativity, and resilience. The aim of her work is to develop greater cultural competency within environmental organizations and institutions, challenge media outlets on their representation of difference, and increase awareness of how privilege shapes who gets to speak to environmental issues and determine policy and action. Dr. Finney is grounded in both artistic and intellectual ways of knowing. She pursued an acting career for 11 years, but five years of backpacking trips to Africa and Asia and living in Nepal changed the course of her life. Motivated by these experiences, Dr. Finney returned to school after a 15 year absence to complete a BA and an MA, which focused on gender and environmental issues in Kenya and Nepal respectively and a PhD, which focused on African-Americans and environmental issues in the US. She has been a Fulbright Scholar, a Canon National Parks Science Scholar, and received a Mellon Postdoctoral Fellowship in Environmental Studies. She has worked with the media in various capacities, including the Tabby Smiley Show, MSNBC, and Vice News Tonight, has written op-eds for Outside Magazine and Newsweek was a guest editor and contributor for a special section on race and the National Parks in Orion magazine. She has participated in a roundtable discussion with REI in the Atlantic, interviewed with various media outlets, including NPR, Sierra Club, Boston Globe and National Geographic, and even filmed a commercial for Toyota that highlighted the importance of African-Americans getting out into nature. Along with, public <laughs> Along with public speaking, writing, consultant, and teaching, she has held positions at Wellesley College and the University of California, Berkeley, and the University of Kentucky. She also served on the U.S. National Parks Advisory Board for eight years, which assists the National Park Service in engaging in relations of reciprocity with diverse communities. Her first book, which I strongly encourage you to read, Black Faces, White Spaces, Reimagining the Relationship of African Americans to the Great Outdoors was released in 2014. Recent publications include The Space Between the Words, A Thousand Oceans, This Moment, Self-Evident Reflections on the Invisibility of Black Bodies in Environmental Histories, and The Perils of Being Black in Public. We are all Christian Cooper and George Floyd. She is currently working on a performance piece about John Muir entitled The N-Word, Nature Revisited, as part of a Mellon residency at the New York Botanical Gardens and is the new columnist at the Earth Islands Journal. She's also currently an artist in residence in the Franklin Environmental Center at Middlebury College. It gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Carolyn Finney. Dr. Finney. Dr. Caldwell, so <laughs> nice to meet you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sorry, I always laugh when you hear somebody reading. I'm like, damn, I'm tired already. <laughs> you know, that's, how, that's how we roll up in here. That's how we have to roll with this work. Anyway, it's nice to meet you. Um, thank you to everybody here at uh, Bob, Bob, I have to see everybody say Bob McLean, Peter Winch, Lizzie for reaching out, and Julian for reaching out, um, and, and all of you that are here today. Um, I wish I was there in person. I, I think I've been saying that a lot the last year because I've been up here in my little box up here in Burlington, Vermont. Um, but I'm glad we can have this conversation. So thank you for that. Uh, you know, so when you see me look down, I have notes, but then what happens is I don't pay any attention to them, but they're supposed to keep me in line. Um, so there's some things I want to say. So thank you for all of you for being here. I've got a lot of things on my mind. Um, I want to start off with a couple of years ago, a couple, I always say a couple, and actually that could be 10. And it was more like 10 years ago, 2010. I was um, on a panel, I was in Oregon, and I can't quite remember which university I was at at the time, but I was with, there with a few other people. Um, and I was on this panel and there was another person from academia on the panel with me. Um, he wrote Slow Violence, he's really amazing. I'm just spacing out on his name for a second, but he's really amazing. 
And there was an activist, Susana Almanza, a Latinx activist who was from East Texas. She had just won some big award for her environmental justice work that, she's, that she um, does down there. And one of the things she said, it was a quote from her that I really appreciated where she said, I'm looking down at my paper. She said, um, when someone asked her a question about collaborating with those who work in academia, she suggested that we need to quote, take off our shoes and remember what it's like to get dirty. Okay, so I wanna start from that place with respect to um, most of you, if not all of you who are grounded um, in academia in a very particular way or in relationship to it like myself, because my relationship has changed over the years for a lot of different reasons. And what does that mean to really take off our shoes and get dirty? Now, one of the things that Lizzie and Julian asked me to do was to give a definition of environmental justice because, but being the way that I am, if you know me at all, I'm gonna wait till near the end to give you that um, definition, my definition, my understanding of what that is. So just hold that thought in your head for a moment. I want to show you some images. I just completely forgot as I was going on there with my little introduction that I had some slides. I'm not gonna show all these slides, so don't get worried, but I do wanna put a few things up here. So here's my title, right? The question of justice, black faces, white spaces, and playing the long game. Um, the stories of now. Okay, uh, so I always have to start with where we are, no matter what it is that I'm talking about, right? I always have to start with where we are. Um, this past year, I don't have to tell any of you on here the challenges of this past year. Uh, for me, right, the pandemic, right, loomed heavily. You know, I'm uh, the last, since fall of 2019, I moved to Burlington, Vermont from Lexington, Kentucky uh, because of the, um, my residency at Middlebury, which is actually part-time on purpose. Um, I was on a plane every week pre-pandemic, you know, two days a week I'd be down in Middlebury, which is about an hour away, and then I'd be getting on a plane to have these conversations and do this work in different parts of the country. And of course, last March, all of that changed and slowly shifted to virtual. Um, when George Floyd was murdered and Christian Cooper had his skin weaponized against him when he walked into Central Park, that was when The Guardian reached out to me. That was last June and said, would you write a piece? What's funny is they actually said, would you write a piece about Christian Cooper since it had a clear and explicit environmental component? And what my response to them is, I'm happy to do it, but you know, this isn't just a piece about Christian Cooper because they're actually on a continuum, you know, one end to the other end, but we're all, you know, many of us are operating within that spectrum at all times. And so I convinced them to let me explain that and talk about that. And then in the background, you see, I have the map of the United States, the political map, you know, um, privileging the Democratic and Republican parties and this idea that somehow we are discovering how divided we are. And I'm always saying, that, you know, what? for the last 500 years, we've been incredibly divided. We've been incredibly diverse and incredibly divided. Um, the other thing that is on my mind at this moment, I don't know if any of you have been watching um, Raul Peck's Exterminate All These Brutes on HBO. And I just have to tell you, the, 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 it was a four part series last two nights it was on. And I love Raul Peck, um, I Am Not Your Negro, the story about using James Baldwin as a way and a, a window into understanding America differently. And I would argue our understanding America more rightly as it is, as we are. Uh, is incredibly powerful. So that's also on my mind. And I may be quoting him here or there because he kind of blew me out of the water as he always does with all his layers. Um, one of the quotes that he said that I wanna start off with too is quote, you already know enough. What is missing is the courage to know what we know, right? And, and then to draw conclusions from that. So here we are having a conversation about justice. Here we are having a, a conversation about environmental justice. And I know that sometimes we're like, well, we don't know there are certain things we're not aware of. And I give everybody that myself included. We don't know everything, right? We know what we know. But I also agree with Raul Peck that we know enough. It's like, it's been laid out in front of us for the last 400 years. We, the, if we think we can say we don't know, I just don't think we're being honest with ourselves. Um, but uh, something else that I want to say about that, which is, I'm going to go to the next slide first. Oh no, yeah, I'm going to come back to that in a second. Um, I want to say that um, I understand that we also have a perspective and a point of view that we come from. It's something that I always say, right? Uh, one of the things that I've been doing this last year, I mean, this is, I do this every day, all day, but 
everything exploded in a way <laughs> that I had never seen previous to this last year in terms of my being asked to engage. So it's everybody from outdoor retailing businesses to government agencies, to museums, to academic institutions, to nonprofits, to faith-based institutions, to art-based institutions. It has been an incredible ride of predominantly white organizations, not always, but predominantly white organizations mostly who do environmental work in the broadest sense, you know, uh, the camera's on, the lights are on, we can see you. We know what, we could always see you. <laughs> but now everybody can see you. And you've got people, many with really good intentions, some not so much, let's be honest, but wanting to try to understand and engage what that means to do this work differently. You know, also the question of justice, what, what does that look like? And not just out there in the world, but in here right, within the organization, the institution, the agency, where often power and privilege sit in a very particular way. And also, what does it mean internally? Because all of these places, institutions, organizations, communities, they're made up of people, individuals, human beings, right, that have agency, just not the same agency at the same time in the same way. So part of this for me is how do we really start to break that down and understand what that is and understand how we each show up. So in one of these conversations a couple of weeks ago, it was um, a, a, a white man who, a very nice guy, he was a part of a little Zoom group we were talking. We considered ourselves around the same age. Um, and he was talking about, he said, I'm looking down my notes here, he said like in the 70s, for him the dominant narratives that he experienced in the 70s, you know, um, he said it was about corruption surrounding Nixon, women's empowerment, the moment of progressive change. Like he really saw that and I said, well, that's really interesting because I also, you know, was in the high school in the 70s and I remember those things, but that's not kind of how I thought about it. I remembered, you know, um, being called all the black kids in my high school and there weren't a lot of us being called out of our classrooms over the loudspeaker because they had to line us up in the hallway and ship us off to the hospital to get tested for sickle cell anemia. I remember the Daughters of the American Revolution awarding me a medal. And because I had this name, Carolyn Finney, so many people thought I was Irish until they saw me. And, you know, there's, there may be some in the background somewhere, but you know, that's not how I identified. And when I show up at that table and those, that very conservative organization and those white women sitting behind there looking kind of shocked and surprised and not, very happy about the fact they have to hand me a medal for the civic duty that I was doing as a kid. I have a lot of stories about that time, but they are not the same stories that stand out. And so part of this for me is also asking the question of where you stand, where I stand, where do you stand? Who are you, right? I mean, it is really easy, in my opinion, to actually externalize you know, what it, what, what it is we need to do because people are dying. And that's absolutely right. People are dying. People are dying every day, all the time. And on that continuum, you have a whole lot of other people that are feeling insecure about who they are and where they are at any given time in this situation, right? But to do that in my mind authentically from a real place of building relationships of reciprocity, you first need to know where you stand. Okay, we should get all serious. So you're all wondering why I love crab country. And I've been popping this in there on a lot of my presentations um, because uh, yeah, I'll tell you why. So I won't give, all, I'll give, you, give away what Lovecraft Country, what happens in this. This is one of my favorite series of 2020, man. It blew me out of the water. Um, the series was built on the stories of H.P. Lovecraft who wrote a lot of weird and science fiction. Um, and then it got transferred to the screen um, in this um, one season series. So. The thing about this series is set in 1950s, right after the Korean War, it starts off in Chicago and it centers on this extended African-American family. Um, and in the opening um, episode, you see that you get to know this family a little bit and they're about to take a road trip. They're gonna take this road trip to Massachusetts as a matter of fact, because there's supposedly this white family that they're related to that practices magic. And you know, cause this whole thing is like Indiana Jones meets Lara Croft, Tomb Raider. There's monsters, there's witches, there's magic. There's a whole kind of thing happening. So they're gonna take a road trip. And like any human being, regardless of skin color or identification, Right? They're excited, they're excited, they're nervous, they're like, what's going on? So they're, just, they're all piling in the car and the, the black matriarch of the family isn't going to go. 
um, because she has a young, they have a young child, she'll stay back with the young child, but it's a sunny day, everybody's excited, right? As they climb into the car, she casually pulls out a notebook and it's almost a throwaway moment where she's saying, let's just make sure you have everything you need here, right? And do you have extra blankets and food? And they're like, we got it, we got it, we got it. They're doing that thing that people do, right? What blew me away is that she's referencing the green book. The green book at a time when if you were black, if you were non-white, you were not traveling anywhere you wanted free of charge. You better make sure you have everything you need. So in case you needed to eat, go to the bathroom, find a place to sleep, you could do that within your car. You didn't necessarily have to pull up into a town because you, you didn't know where you were because this was during Jim Crow. This was during segregation. There is no way you can tell the story and center it on black people without considering that they have to consider that as well, which didn't diminish the story at all. The center of the story was this adventure they were about to go on. A little bit further in the scene, they're down the road. I think they've hit Massachusetts at this point and they get pulled over by a white state trooper. And it's a few minutes before seven o'clock, the sun's about to set. And he says to them, do you know where you are? And they kind of say, yeah, they were looking at the map. And he said, well, this is a sundown county. And if you're caught here in the next seven minutes, I can't make any promises to you what's gonna happen to you. Because sundown towns are a real thing. They were a real thing. Some would argue they still are a real thing. If you are non-white and, and in particular, if you're black and you're caught in a some of these towns after sundown, you know, it's open season on you right there. Um, and later they do run into real monsters in the woods and there's blood and gore and all that stuff happens. But the point that I want to make is it's really interesting when you center the story differently from not only just a different perspective, that's the light way to say, when you give it to another person, when you decenter whiteness, let me just say it like that. That's right. If you just decenter whiteness and imagine a different experience of that time, it's going to change the way that we understand the story. It actually doesn't diminish the experience of someone who is white. I want to be really clear about that because whiteness for me is not a bad thing. Nobody can help the skin they were born in, but whiteness is about power. That's what James Baldwin says. It is about power in this country. That's what Raul Peck says. <laughs> like if you're watching it and understanding how that's constructed, you understand what that is. So it doesn't diminish a white person's experience but it actually expands the way we understand these multiple experiences in relationship to each other, right? And the power of that, and also the challenge of that as well. The other thing that I wanna mention just really briefly is the idea of, you know, if I think of representational justice, really, again, who do we see in these stories that we tell? Because the mainstream environmental movement, do I even need to say this? Who do we see, at least historically, who have we seen in the way environment has been defined, the way who gets to show up in it, who gets to decide what counts as useful knowledge in, in, in spaces of knowledge production. It goes on down the line, the way that we create that knowledge, the way we talk about it, the way we hold it, what we prioritize, what we privilege, it just rolls down to legislation, education, um, and just the way we even think and look at each other on the day to day. Uh, it was an article I read a couple of weeks ago in the Paris Review. It was written by a Black journalist named Maura Cheeks. And she was talking about the writer and thinker Fran Lebowitz, as well as the writer and thinker Toni Morrison. And Fran Lebowitz um, had been saying she doesn't understand why people want to see themselves in books, because books are supposed to be doors. And then she got in this conversation with Toni Morrison about it and said, I just don't understand why people want to see themselves in books. There's, they're not supposed to be representations. It's supposed to be doors. And actually, Toni Morrison said to her, you know, but I am my reader. And Fran was like, no, you're not. And she's like, yeah, I am. And Maura Cheeks, the Black woman who wrote the article, said, Fran Leibowitz just doesn't know what she had because she's always been represented. She can see herself everywhere. She can choose to ignore it or not ignore it. But her experience of herself in her white skin, knowing that she's Jewish and there's a lot of diversity in there, right? There always is, right? But it's always centered and present. And so for her, perhaps all she needs is a door. But for a lot of us, we not only want a door, but we're also looking for a mirror. So what does it look like? What does that look like in this larger conversation about environmental justice? So I say that question about where do you stand? Because I have to ask the same question too, because we're all biased. 
right? We're all biased. Doesn't mean we're all racist in my opinion or, or all prejudiced, but those things operate like close cousins. They live together. And if you are not clear about your own bias, how can you guarantee that you aren't practicing some form of, some form of racism? Right. And it is not enough to say that you did not intend to do that because you have a good heart and are good intention. What does it mean to actually do the work and call out yourself in order to call yourself into this conversation differently? So I can't do that without actually tell, talking a little bit about my own bias. I call it the subjectivity of perspective because I believe all knowledge is subjective. Right. You bring all of who you are to bear upon anything it is that you are trying to understand. Right. And that's OK. I'm not judging that. I'm just pointing that out in a very particular way. And I do it too. I do it too. So I talk about how my parents, Rose and Henry, grew up poor, grew up black um, in Virginia in the 30s and 40s and 50s. So during Jim Crow segre segregation, they have a high school education. My dad went off to fight in the Korean War. So I usually start this story at the same place Lovecraft Country starts their story right after the Korean War. When he returned from that war, he tried to get a job in Virginia. The job he tried to get was with the Park Service because he saw a park ranger in a park ranger uniform. He thought that looked like a great government job. And so when he went to apply, they said, oh, we're sorry, but we don't hire Negroes. So he, like a lot of other black people, and my mother decided we're going to move north. They went to New York. My father had two job, uh, two job offers. One, he could be a janitor in Syracuse, New York. Syracuse is about five hours north of New York City, which I'm sure many of you know. And the other that the job he ended up taking was only 30 minutes outside of New York City in Westchester County. You see some of these pictures here. A very wealthy Jewish family owned a 12 acre estate. They needed full time caretakers to live on this estate and care for it. So my parents took that job. My father was the landscape gardener. He was the chauffeur. My mom was a sometime housekeeper. The house you're seeing right there is actually the gardener's cottage where they lived. They wanted to have kids. They thought they couldn't have kids, which is a whole other story about the way that women and poor black women in particular can be treated um, in the medical system. So the owners helped them adopt me. So I was adopted from Spence Chapin, which is a Jewish adoption agency in New York City. And then what I always say is they relaxed and had my first brother and then more relaxing happened and they had my second brother. So here we are in this very wealthy, all white neighborhood, Harry Winston property down the street, Schaefer, Schaefer Beer next door, Wingfield Golf Club right around the corner from this. We're the only family of color in this neighborhood until the 1990s when a Japanese American woman moved in for a few years and then she moved out. Let me show you some more pictures of this. You, couldn't, you can't take a bad picture of this estate. This estate had um, apple, pear, peach trees, vegetable gardens, flower gardens. There's a swimming pool. There's a pond with fish in it, really stunning. My brothers and I knew how to swim by the time we were seven. We had to because of the water on this property in case we fell in, you know, playing outside all the time. There are woods, just a simply stunning piece of property. This is the house belonging to the owners. The owners only came up on weekends and holidays most of the time. So it was like we had the run of our own private park. But the story that I tell, I tell to people when I start to get a sense of myself in this skin, living in this place, is when I was nine walking in from school, I went to a public school, the Maranick Avenue Public School, largely Italian American working class, some African American working class. And I was, so I was nine, I'm right around the corner from my house, you know, I think it was about three, 3.30 in the afternoon. There were always policemen patrolling this neighborhood. And this white policeman in his car pulled me over, pulled me over, I'm, you know, nine walking home. And he stops me and he wants to know where I'm going. And I give him the address of the place. And then he just looks at me and says, oh, do you work there? And I'm thinking, dude, I'm nine. Right. And I'm thinking, no, I'm confused. And I say, I live there. He lets me go after a minute. I go home. I tell my parents, my father gets furious. He calls the police station. He gives a mail. Right. Um, but later, as an adult, I have to ask the question, what were the logics at place there? Right. What were the logics at place when you see a little girl, school bag, time of day, all the ways, all the cues were there. But the only way that he can imagine me there is that I must be working there even though this is what the late 60s, I don't know, the early 70s, and I don't quite understand where he got that idea, but I, yes, I do, that's a lie. Um, I wanna jump ahead a little bit. I wanna jump ahead into the 90s. One of the owners died. The matriarch of the family was very sick. My parents have been caring for this land for nearly 40 years. 
at this point, um, she was like, what's gonna happen to my parents? She thought about trying to keep them on this land. This land is worth over $3 million. The property taxes were over $125,000 a year. This was in the nineties, right? So there wasn't any way to keep my parents on this property. At the end, she had a house built for them in Leesburg, Virginia. And the reason it was Leesburg, my youngest brother was married with kids, was settled there. I don't know that I'll ever be settled, but me or my other brother. So that's where they chose to do. She passed away, the new owner came on, my parents stayed on until 2003 because there always has to be somebody caring for this property, this land full time. When they left and moved to their house in Leesburg, it's a lovely house on about a half an acre of land. Um, they, the new owner found a family from the Dominican Republic who moved in. When they moved down there, I watched my father in particular get incredibly depressed because he talked about missing this land. He talked about having no land to pass down to his children. He just, he talked about it incessantly actually. Um, and what we didn't know, he was, he was at the edge of beginning to get dementia, but we didn't know that at the time. My parents, a few years after they moved to Leesburg got a letter. It was a copy of a letter, which I now have. It was from the Westchester Land Trust. It was letting everybody know in the neighborhood that a conservation easement had now been placed on this land. That meant in perpetuity, nothing can be changed. It talked about all the environmental values of the land. It talked about the wildlife and the, the flora. It talked about where it sits in the watershed. At the end of the letter, it thanked the new owner for his conservation mindedness. I, I think he'd been on the land maybe five years at that point. There was nothing in the letter thanking my parents who'd been on caring for that land full time for nearly 50 years. And that's the point, this was around 2003, 2004, 2005, when I started asking the questions about, you know, who has it been erased in the larger narrative about this country as it relates to the environment? Who has been erased? Part of what I understand about the environmental justice movement, the birth of that movement, fabulous Dr. Robert Bullard, what I understand is in part is that it is a response to a mainstream environmental movement that just can't see anybody that doesn't look like itself and has the privilege and the power to define what that relationship is between people and the environment in every sector, in every corner of this country from the beginning. And it is even more complicated than that. I'll come back to that in a second. So this is to let you know that I'm really clear about my own bias. And I understand that that actually informs the way that I show up, that I ask the questions. If we're gonna talk about public lands, what public are we talking about? And who gets to say we the people? Who gets to say who the we the people is? How is that defined? So for me, this is always a moment of convergence. We are always, and there is something about 2020 and 2021, and the hits, they just keep on coming. But there's a way within which, for me, we have always been here, right? I took this quote from Raoul Peck um, last night, the past has a future we never expect. The past has a future we never expect. Wherever we go, there we are. Well, no matter how far we get down the road, two things will always be true. One, that we stole this land from the original peoples, the indigenous peoples. This land was stolen and we killed them, we removed them. And we continue, I think, in many ways to perpetuate that in different forms. And that we enslaved another group of people to work this land for free to build the backbone of our economy. I know it's more complicated, but it's really easy for me to start up with those two things that I don't care what else we say and what else we do. That's always true for me. There will always be blood in the soil in a very particular way. When I put these images up here, I'm thinking about slavery and Japanese internment and immigrants, Mexican immigrants crossing the border and Native American removal and the pollution we do, you know, the things we do to the land itself as human beings. But it's hard to have this conversation in this country and not consider that out front, loud and proud, I have these very famous images of Gifford Pinchot, the man with the mustache over here on the top, who you know, found the idea of forest management and conservation and the forest service and Yale forestry. You know, the idea that we can manage the resource for our use. I want you to think about that because we frame this conversation in two ways all the time about ourselves in relation to to the environment. We frame it as um, the environment as a supermarket of resources for our use. And we frame it as our, you know, or we think of it as recreation. So those are the two primary ways we privilege in terms of how we engage. So think about those two things and think about the question of systemic racism and the question of environmental justice. Where the hell does it fit in there? 
That's really hard to consider if you don't know or if you act like you don't know, or you don't want to know because you have the privilege, <laughs> what, what do I always say? Privilege has the privilege of not seeing itself. What does that mean to actually consider how it fits in there? Let alone the idea that if you ask an indigenous person that we have never been separate from the environment in the first place, we are actually part of it, which changes the relationship and it changes our actions in relationship to that place, right? Over here, the other picture, the famous picture is President Roosevelt and John Muir, that's 1903. It's overhanging rock in Yosemite. You're imagining them having this conversation about land, parks, wilderness, all these things. I don't wanna necessarily take anything away from them in order to make the point, right? They're having this conversation about all of that, but what else is going on at the same time? I believe this picture of Gifford Pinchot was late 1800s. So all around the same time, I'm always asking what was going on at the same time. I think about a few years before that, 1862, the Homestead Act. I never thought about the Homestead Act before this, but the Homestead Act. For me, that started to really solidify and codify that relationship and link it to power in a very particular way. For the most part, if you were of European descent, you could come over here, that gun could go off at midnight, you could go out and put your stake down on up to 160 acres of land. And if you stayed on it for five years, if you farmed, if you built a home, that land was yours free and clear. That cannot happen anywhere in this world. And land is never just about land. It is about economic and political power. It is about the right to say that you belong. It is about the right to have a legacy to hand down to your children. And but three years later, Emancipation Proclamation, when enslaved Africans are freed, they're originally given 400,000 acres of land. And then white plantation owners said, what have we done? We just gave people who were our property 400,000 acres of land. And land is never just about land. It's about economic and political power. It is about legacy. It's about the right to say you belong. I don't think so. And they took all that land back. And while you have a few African-American homesteaders, you do have a few, right? Never, not anything like the numbers of people of European descent. And I'm really careful not to also take anything away from the European immigrants, many of them who were forced to leave where they came from, who took a risk to came over here. Something like 60% of them died taking that risk for themselves and their family. But I also have to ask the question, who had to be removed from that land in order for them to have that chance? Wow, if you ask me, this is where all our troubles really started. Well, they really started when Christopher Columbus lost his way and then had the privilege of defining what this place was based on his perspective and point of view with no consideration for the people that were always here and the nature, the non-human nature that was always here. I'm on a roll now, I don't even know what's happening. Okay. So for me, it is this, we can have a conversation about environmental justice, but that justice in part is embedded in our willingness to confront our history. Because again, wherever we go, there we are. What does it mean for us to show up now and have this conversation? What does it mean for me to do it? I start with myself. What does it mean for me to do it? How real can I be about this? Um, I've been saying, you know, the first chapter of my book, I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but I wanted to start here about bamboozled. I borrowed um, Spike Lee because I love me some Spike Lee um, as a cultural interrogator and storyteller. Uh, the idea he's talking about, we've been, been bamboozled as it relates to the ways in which we think of African-Americans in the media. I think we've been bamboozled about the environmental narrative from the beginning. The idea that somehow Jim Crow segregation only meant when you went to a restaurant or a movie or tried to go to school, it meant everywhere. I don't care how beautiful the beach is, how beautiful the mountain is, how beautiful the park is, how beautiful the street is, that you just want to walk down safely and get to, from point A to point B. As though that is not part of the experience. In part, that's why I understand um, folks like Robert Bullard and activists back in the 70s and 80s were in part, in part responding to that and saying, it isn't only about this. It is also about this, who we are, who we are in relationship to each other. Oh, how am I doing for time, y'all? Because I, okay. I, I've talked a lot about representation. Um, so I'm gonna leave this alone for a minute and somebody can ask me about it and I can come back to it. What I want to say in this, in this vein is that in 1964, when the Civil Rights Act was passed, a powerful thing, and as a young black person, I understood really, you know, loosely what that meant. It sounded like it meant, you know, more freedom, more opportunities for Black people to show up. What I didn't know until I was doing this as research at the same year, the Wilderness Act was passed. 
I didn't even know what that was before, you know. And so I looked closely at the two pieces of legislation, equally powerful, equally committed groups of people coming in, Howard Zanizer and his People for the Wilderness Act, all the folks who, who sat down for the Civil Rights Act. What's really interesting in particular in the Wilderness Act is the language. You know, the ability to use universal language to define an experience of a country of people, even with the best intentions, the ability to aspire to a kumbaya without actually addressing the original sin, <laughs> without actually addressing, you know, what is actually happening. The idea that George Floyd can get killed, like there's nothing new about that, right? We can draw a direct line from that murder to the fugitive slave laws. There's, we can draw a direct line from redlining to understanding why we're not seeing green spaces and healthy spaces for black and brown and poor people in their neighborhoods. There's direct lines all over. There's so many direct lines. You can get lost even walking in the direct line, right? The idea that we don't think about what that is. We have all the information. Raul Peck says it. We already know what we know. Now, what are we willing to do about it, right? Uh, somebody can ask me about John Muir and Christian Cooper, but I'm going to move on. I'm going to move forward because I want to leave time, making sure we have time for questions. I always ask the question of what are we trying to sustain? Sustainability is a funny word, right? Because, you know, it's like a lot of words these days, diversity, equity, inclusion, sustainability. It's like we say them over and over again. And for me, I have to continually interrogate. So I'm asking you and I ask myself, what is it that we're trying to sustain? I know we talk a lot about um, that river, that beach, that ocean, that park. We even talk about community community sometimes when I'm feeling fresh, you know, you know, sort of romanticizing that notion of a community. But really for me, this is about relationship, not just our relationship as human beings to non-human nature all around us, but our relationship to each other. And if we think, if we think we can make any changes externally from who we are and who we've been without dealing with who we are and who we've been and have it mean anything, we are fooling ourselves as I believe we've fooled ourselves for the last 450 years. The power of this moment is we can actually do something different. I put both of these images up here. The white man is Ian Gibson. This is probably maybe 10 years ago now. I read about him online. He's a sport hunter. He likes to go to South Africa and hunt elephants for sport. And so I guess he can put the head up on as well. And I have a lot of problems with that. You can tell it even just the way when I'm saying it. He's 50, he was 53 years old at the time. I read this article and it talked about how he went with black and white men, they were hunting. He got too close to a young bull elephant and he got gored to death and he didn't die immediately, but he died, right? And so as I'm reading this and then I fall into the comments because I'm reading this online, you know how that goes. And as I'm reading the comments, the comments were brutal. The comments were saying things like he got what he deserved, one for the elephant, and it just kept going on and on. Now, I love elephants. I don't understand sport hunting. This is a white man. I'm a black woman. There were so many things different here. I was like, dude, I don't even know, dude, why you were doing what you were doing in the first place. But by the time, you know, 30 minutes later, I'm reading those brutal comments, I was in tears. There was only one comment in there that had any compassion for the way he died and who he was. They, they weren't defending his right to hunt that elephant, but just that he was a human being, right? And it was at that moment I said, okay, okay, here's where I got to do some work. This doesn't deny me my anger. This doesn't mean I don't want to hold him accountable, but I have to imagine he came from one of those communities. He has family, people cared about him, and it had to be a horrible way to go. And if I don't have any way to recognize his humanity, how do I keep asking others to see my own? And I understand that I have a leg up on him because I come from a long extended history where I have been denied my humanity, but still, but still, I have the agency to make a different choice. I put him up here next to this young boy, which was linked to the story of Flint, Michigan, and all that lead in the water that politicians and a whole lot of other people in power knew for a very long time. And we have no idea what the impact is going to be on these children who are predominantly African-American. What does that mean over time? They could have made a different choice and they didn't for a variety of reasons. But I, have, I don't have to spend any time over here because I'm all up in here. I understand that if he's a child, he's a little black child, you don't even have to prove to me. I don't have to do any work there. But I gotta do some work up here with Ian Gibson. Because again, I'm asking me and others, what are we trying to sustain? What is, because sustain also implies a kind of status quo. And I know that's not what we mean, right? We don't wanna say that's what we mean. But really, 
you know, sustain implies that we don't actually have to change anything. And if you want to engage difference, if you want to engage diversity, if you think you can do that without changing, you're not engaging at all, right? It's what I always say to people, please do not do outreach. I have been outreach too. Outreach means I can outreach to you, bring you to my table, make space for you. I'm incredibly nice. And then you got to learn everything about the table. Right? You got to learn the mission statement. You got to learn the culture. You got to learn the language. We actually don't have to learn anything about you and nothing changes. The thing I've been saying lately to everybody is like, look, as an organization, as an institution, as an agency, <clears throat> you do not have to throw out the baby and the bathwater. It's important. I actually don't believe in leaving anybody by the wayside, if at all possible, though in part, that'll be in part up to them. Um, but you know, and it's important for us to have institutional memory. It's important for us to know who we've been so we don't make the same mistakes again. But if you really want to engage change, you better be willing to get a new bathtub. You cannot expect to keep it as it is and have the new thing. You cannot expect to do the great work of taking care of some natural space in a different and new way if you haven't attended to the relationships. The relationships. <laughs> of all the diverse people, the power that's always in the room, the privilege that's always in the room. What does that look like for us to do that? This was just a brief, because I had to put this up there, thinking about recreation and the idea of environmental justice, right? The idea that we have an $887 billion outdoor retailing industry. Do you think this doesn't have anything to do with justice? This isn't just about simply going for a hike. This country has always run on right, and in part has been motivated by how much money can be made because wealth equals power. So while I know a lot of really great people who work in this industry, I know I've been working with people who are trying to change things up. I can say that about people as an individual. This is an $887 billion industry. So they've got a lot at stake in the status quo, whether they know it or whether they're willing to recognize it or not. What does justice look like in this space? How do we deal with that? So the last thing that I wanna say, whew, I went so far off my book here, but I'm gonna read this because I wanna read what I wrote here. I wanna talk about the question of this being a long game. And it kind of came up for me, and I'm not trying to be political, but I'm always political because this is political, this is intimate, and this is personal, is the day of the inauguration, the point when Roy Blount, the Senator, the Republican Senator from Missouri, presented President Joe Biden with this picture, which you're seeing here by Robert S. Duncanson, who was a black artist back in 1859. And he painted this bucolic, it looks like something from that time, right, of the landscape. This is what the land looks like with that rainbow. The reason I was so blown away is because how can I, I was like, how can I, a man, a black man and a black body in 1859, slavery is still happening. I read about how he had me mental illness issues because I, I was always going over the border to Canada. I can't imagine what it was like that what he thought is I can paint the landscape with a rainbow because a rainbow is symbolic of hope and possibility. I like to say a hundred years later when I was born exactly 100 years later that he was dreaming of the possibility of me, that I became possible in this, in that moment, that he was playing the long game. It wasn't about him being here for it, but he, it was about him doing whatever he could do to imagine something greater in part for his own survival, but for the rest of us as well. So I wanna come back to that environmental justice um, 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 definition that I promised you all that I would say here. Um, and here's what I wrote, because I want to write wrote it as I wrote it. Um, environmental justice right here. All right. Okay. So what I wrote here was that um, it is, I can't find my notes here. Sorry. Sorry. To, give me a second, because I really, really wanted to read this. I really, really wanted to read this. So one of the things, oh, no, no, hold it. Give me one second. Bridget's baby, baby, baby. This is what happens when you go off book, but I'm going to say this thing. Oh, here we go. Okay. Um, I wrote here, I understand environmental justice is a movement that originally responded to a moment and a narrative about the environment that ignored, diminished, and brushed over the realities of a lived experience with the environment that for Black, Brown, Indigenous, and poor people was in part divined by a history of systemic racism that impacted all areas of their lives, right down to the water they drink and the air that they breathe. It is about every child who can't breathe and every neighborhood that has a food desert and every toxic waste dump that pollutes the bodies of those who have no choice but to call it home. 
It is also about an $887 billion industry that continues to define what the environment is and, and who we should best engage and who we should best engage around it and who gets a chance to prioritize it as they see fit. It is also about a media and a nonprofit industrial complex that with good intentions continues to fuel a myth about of the white savior that overshadows others, right? And we all lose, all right? But for this, for me, just environmental justice isn't singular. It doesn't operate on its own. It isn't only about an exact and specific environmental issue. Systemic racism is in everything. Power and privilege is in everything. For me, it behooves us when we are selective about what it is we look at and how we do that. So how might we do that differently? Um, I wrote here, um, you know, for, we need our whole selves right now, right? I need not only your intellectual brilliance, but we need your heart. I need you to feel what it's like to be able not to breathe, not only when a police officer has his knee on your neck, but when you live in one of these neighborhoods with one of these toxic waste dumps where you can't breathe. But, when you are, but it is also when you are denied your full humanity in the classroom, the conference room, the written page, in your job, the elevation of certain knowledge and narratives that obscures or erases other ways of knowing and being in the world. All of that carries over. It is like a domino effect. What do we privilege? How do we privilege? That for me is what environmental justice is. But the last thing I wanna say is my favorite quote. One of my favorite quotes is from Cornell West Justice is what love looks, like, love looks like in public. We don't say this a lot in a lot of agencies and institutions, that it's really about love. You know, who do you stand with? A couple of years ago, I was in the airport in San Francisco and I was standing in line waiting to get on this plane and there was a South Asian woman standing in front of me and two white women standing behind me. And then we were told there was gonna be a slight delay. And so, you know how it is, you kind of turn around at each other and go like, oh my God, well, here we go again. Well, I got in this conversation with a South Asian woman who was physically kind of short and small, but man, when she started talking, she scared me, she was powerful. She said her job was, she had been to 75 countries. She goes around to businesses to talk about questions of diversity, but she didn't crack a smile. She wasn't trying to be friendly, but she was forthright. And one of the things that she said to me and the two women standing behind me, she said, you know, empathy and sympathy are nice, but who do you stand with? And for me, the question of love in justice is everything. Because when you love something, when you love someone, you're willing to go to the mat for it. You're, it that is about ride or die, because this is about ride or die. And you are willing to give up something for it. Because if you think you can do this without giving up anything, this is not about anybody's comfort. There's been a whole lot of people who've been uncomfortable this entire time, which isn't the same as feeling safe. But this isn't about comfort. What are we willing to give up in order to get something new and different? That is what justice is. What am I willing to give up? Because I believe that you're worth it. So that's where I'll stop. Or otherwise I'll take off from the seat. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much. Didn't I, I guaranteed <laughs> that there was going to be Challenge, thoughtful, provoking uh, di a conversation shared with us. So impactful. I've been furiously taking notes over here. Uh, <laughs> I'm so excited about this conversation. I'm going to invite Lanise to join us. Yes. Um, so I know we want, we want to encourage um, you to continue to put questions in the Q&A section. And if you still want to offer uh, remarks in the chat, please feel free. But we encourage folks to um, continue to uh, uh, submit questions in the Q&A. So we do have a question already. Yeah. That we'll start with. I have a lot of my own, but I'm going to start with the one <laughs> in, the, in the chat. Can you speak a bit about the appropriation of the quote, cancel culture, oh. end quote, narrative? to justify racist thought in policy? Oh my gosh. Well, anybody who's heard me speak say, well, I can't even cancel culture. Um, and so first of all, I have, that's a great question. Thank you for that. And I, cancel culture makes me absolutely crazy because I, I, I'm just gonna be blunt. You know, I, I'm not asking people to agree with me, but um, bear with me for a second. So, you know, I always ask people, what is the intention? What is the intention 
right? If you were clear about your intention, is your intention, what cancel culture means to me is that no matter who's saying it, uh, we can cancel that person out. We can cancel that person out. That's all, that's what we can do. And there, and then we're done. Then we can get back to business as usual, actually. And I, for me, cancel culture changes almost nothing except that we cancel that person out. Because for me, I, what I recognize in particular from some people, it's about the intention is to get accountability. And I'm all about getting accountability. I want accountability, right? And I, I want accountability with change. I want accountability that actually is going to translate into something better, something different. Right? I want accountability that's going to acknowledge a humanity that we all possess. That, and I'm all about, and some people need to be held accountable longer than other people. I'm all about that too. I understand that. Let's define what the accountability is, not spend our time canceling people out. That appropriation, oh my God, I'm going to say this, and I mean this, I mean this kindly, is actually, it's kind of lazy. I'm like, it's kind of easy for some. You know, I, what I understand, I've canceled people out. So <laughs> I understand that the emotional thing is real, right? I understand the emotional labor is real. I understand the impact is real. And sometimes it's lives at stake, right? I'm all about it, but I will not forget last summer. And I wish I could remember her name, that famous video that went around of that black woman. I think she was in New York on the street and she looked in the camera and she said, you better be glad we're all not, all, we're not all about revenge. When she said, and I was like, there, right? Because she made a different choice. She said, the anger is real. The hurt is real. We're, and we're down for the fight. But actually the intention is not revenge. So again, let's go back to that cancel culture. You know, appropriate it, don't appropriate it. Why we would want to use it at all? Because I want something greater than that. You know, I've told everybody that as much as I hope to meet Christian Cooper and we may find ourselves on a panel or in a conversation, you know the person I really want to have a public conversation with is Amy Cooper. This is where I want to go, right? That's the conversation because she took a hit for all white people. <laughs> I'm just going to say it, right? I'm not saying she shouldn't have been held accountable for what she said and did. Oh, yes, she should. But really, that she loses everything, she gets canceled out. What I want to know is, has she changed her mind? What has happened since? What has the power of that story and what that story, what that could open up with some of her peoples? Oh, that's what I want to know. And how can I assist her in that? Because <laughs> I got some things to say. <laughs> this is where I want to show up because my intention is to see change across the board. I don't want to see another black, brown, or indigenous person beaten, killed, dismissed, um, transacted, extracted, appropriated, used, overlooked, erased. I am tired of it. I'm tired of it in my own life. I'm tired of it everywhere else. We can be better as human beings. So what does that demand of me? Getting all worked out. It's early in the day. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much yeah. for that response. Um, and and as you, you, you also talk about in your work uh, a great deal about transforming higher education. Yeah. Um, and I, I love the analogy about we need to get dirty or the, the, the comment about we need to get dirty. I yeah. also like the throwing out the bathtub. I want to use that one. Uh, Please. So much to change the bathtub. <laughs> uh, but also, you know, you talk a lot about knowledge production and yes. what gets privileged in knowledge production. And just yes. because a particular publication is read by many people, does yes. it meet the intent that it was supposed to meet, which was to change right, yes. the culture or change the way of thinking or understanding yes. the world. So what, what are some practical ways that you transform institutions of higher education in your work or your, you know, involvement with those institutions? And then just some things that we can think about moving forward and how we can make those trans make some transformation. Dr. Katrina, you are asking some really good questions. The audience is asking some good questions, taking me, taking me to church in my own way here. Yeah, this one's always a, you know, I come at this question in a lot of different ways because I have bias about this with respect to 
you know, my returning to school, I understand the privilege of getting to spend time in an academic institution. I understand how it opened, it, you know, opened up my mind, you know, opened up the kinds of relationships I have, the privilege, the privileges that I have accrued because of that. And it's also important for me to say that in this body, academia nearly did me in and I'm still traumatized by it. I'm, I'm just gonna be honest with institutions that fought over the way that I, that, that I talk about these issues, how I wrote these issues. And it, it was a very public fight in one institution. It's very public, I talk about it all the time. And so I don't wanna go down that road too far because um, it does have its own traumatizing effect, right? And so, and my frustration because there's so many great people who are brilliant who spend time in academic institutions that I know, love, work with, and respect, right? So what does that mean? So for myself, it was like, how can I remain in relationship without being in it? I couldn't be in it anymore. It was like the Borg for me in Star Trek. I was, it was like, you can only be here if you assimilate because the understanding of diversity was not about difference. It was about assimilation and I just couldn't do it anymore, right? Um, and so my experience, the, the reason actually, um, Katrina, Dr. Katrina, I like to call you Dr. Katrina, that I changed my bio at the bottom to say that I'm an artist in residence and as opposed to scholar in residence. When the folks at Middlebury College and the Franklin Environmental Center reached out to me two years ago, I was at the University of Kentucky and I had left academia just, I said, I'm out. I think I can make enough money doing what I'm doing, but I can still engage, um, was that I said, let's construct it on the model of an, I don't want a full-time academic position. You know, I have massive debt, but I, I need my freedom in order to show up, right, in a very particular way. And I took the model of that. We called me a scholar in residence and professor in practice. They've just extended it. And now we change it to artist in residence, in part because I live at an intersection. My background in the arts, as well as my academic experience and my lived experience. And I want to give all three of those the room to breathe. You know, in watching Raoul Peck as a Haitian film director layer his stories, he layers. That's the beauty. The, so how can we think within an academic institution, how can we think differently about rigor and discipline? You know, rigor for me is not about how we do the same thing in the same way all the time. <laughs> rigor for me is about clarity about our intention and how our work is in service to that intention. How are we rigorous about our practice? Right. And what is our practice? Right. And for me, the power of abstract thinking, of grabbing from all different places, knowledge exists everywhere. Right. There is the knowledge that many of us learn within an academic institution. That's not all of knowledge. <laughs> That's some knowledge that has been constructed in a very particular way in service to a particular something. I'm not taking, making any judgment on it. This isn't about judgment. Let's just use discernment instead of judgment, right? To think about that. But there's also embodied knowledge. There's spiritual knowledge. There is the, the dream time. There's the, in the arts, there's their music. It is everywhere. Our privilege, those of us who've come through academic institutions, we have the privilege, we are a small percentage of the world that has the privilege to take the time to think with a roof over our head and food at the table, <laughs> time to write, the time to talk with each other about it. It behooves us to narrow that so much. We can't even see ourselves anymore. We just moving in a straight line to a place that we're not even sure we want to go. What does it mean? You know, someone said to me when I left the University of California, Berkeley, they said, you know, well, if you're not appreciated here, you know, you can take your toys and play in another sandbox. And I said, I appreciate that sentiment, but that's the problem. I don't want to play in the sandbox. I want to play on the beach. What do I need to do that? You know, because isn't that also what we're say we're doing within an institution of knowledge production? The, the, the original idea somewhere, the kernel of innovation, creativity, liberal, free thinking, free, and freedom costs something. And what does that mean? You know, when I'm looking at me, I'm looking at Lanise, I'm looking at Katrina, a hundred years ago, we would not have been allowed in most institutions to think freely, right? 
it's powerful, powerful for me to just see their faces here. I'm just like, yes, can we keep this going all day? You know, and I love all kinds of people. I'm all up in it, but I don't get to see this a lot in a lot of spaces of knowledge production around the conversation of the environment, <laughs> right? Right. So for me, it's how can we develop practices? What does it mean to push that, you know, as a professor, as a student, as a staff person, knowing that everybody doesn't have the same power and the same agency in the same way? What does it mean for those in positions of power to actually use that power? And it's a risk. I always say a risk in order to gain, right? It's not a risk. Don't, you're not taking a risk because you're trying to hold on to something. You don't want to lose it. No, it's a risk in order to gain. And there will be some things lost. So what kind of practice of support can we develop for that? You know, I don't believe I have to leave anybody by the wayside. I'm not gonna operate like traditional oppressors have operated. But sometimes I gotta catch myself, you know, because I've been educated in that system, that hierarchy, that this is the way that you do relationships that it is about enough, get enough for me, but I'm not really worried about you. I'm actually not operating that way. I believe everybody can make the choice to get on the train or their own train. We can all, we're all moving to the future <laughs> at the very least. That's where we're going. So what does that look like to do that together? And what, and one of the better spaces to do it are academic institutions because we train ourselves in some ways to actually dig deep and do it thoughtfully. I could keep going. You have to, wow. you have to that jump was in. So powerful. I'm just trying to take it all in. Okay. Um, I have another question um, from one of our participants. Uh, he is an official um, viewer of public lands. And his question really is about um, the connection to power and control. So he said, with respect to the balance between access of undeveloped lands and control of development, Mm. Is your focus on moving to more involvement by people from different backgrounds and making those decisions, or are you talking about something else? So really, you looking for you to clarify that. Okay, yeah, thank you for that. I'm not actually saying either or. I'm kind of like, a, I try to stay away from the either or in part because we are a geographically diverse country. So when I think if we just talk about land, it's geographically diverse, we don't even have to talk about the people. And getting to know any piece of land, um, means, I mean, really getting to know it, right, beyond what we think we want to use it for means we have to know the history of that land. I learned recently from a Beneke woman, and I meant to say at the beginning that I am on the land, the traditional land of the Beneke people here in Vermont, that the, the history of land acknowledgement came out of truth and reconciliation. In part, she said, the problem with just reciting something at the beginning, she goes, is that most people don't actually have any real relationship or knowledge with the land. She says, real relationship takes time. A real land acknowledgement, she, she challenged me, was that you're going to just have to start with, sometimes it's just like, well, this guy, I noticed this tree. Like, you really have to know the stuff. So part of that question of, is it ownership and control? How do we even know who should do what? We don't even know who's actually been there. What is the memory in place? What are the people, you know, to assume that we can see everyone that's there? I mean, I can't either because I don't, you don't know what you don't know. How many people have always been there but are largely invisible to both the processes that have been put in place by government agencies and nonprofits, many, well-meaning, thoughtful, hardworking, right? With a, with a good sense of what they think they want to do. And then finding out partway down the road, like many are finding out right now in this past year, that there's all this other stuff that was <laughs> always there happening all the time, right? So that's why I'm not avoiding the question. I'm just saying the question is complex. So I think it starts with where you are. What's going on with where you are? What piece of land? How do we respect the diversity of the land itself. What is there? What was there? Who is around it? What are the different ways of engaging it? What does the land need going forward? What kind of, and I mean that not in any woo-woo way, I mean in a real concrete way. We talk about caretaking and sustainability and protection, all of those things. What does the land need? You know, And who can best give that? You know, and what is it about our existing structures of funding, 
you know, you know, our organizational structures that support that and ones that do not. Who best knows what they can do? What does it really mean to build allyship and work together with people who may know a lot about it because they've been living on it for the last 150 years with their peoples and their families, but they're the last ones who get asked to be at the table, so to speak. What does that look like? So I, then the decision, the answer to that question is, for me is collectively, the people closest to that land get to make that decision about what's best for it. Should it be protected? What we're gonna do with it? I should never be the one doing it unless I'm, I've become part of that conversation and help build those relationships over time. It doesn't mean my perspective doesn't have a point of view. So that's really where I'm going with it. It's not one or the other. It is actually more of the process and the practice of determining what we should do. And who is the we, right? I always come back to that. That's what I'm really interested in. Wow. So I'm gonna um, take the last two questions and put them together. Okay. They relate a lot. Um, so one uh, participant asked, can you speak about um, a bit about the injustice between minority groups and how that affects the injustice movement? And the other question mm -hmm. is talking about here now, our country is extremely polarized. Um, and when we think about um, conservation and how we conserve, um, what are on both sides of that issue? How can we um, balance the needs of everyone, but uh, definitely um, really raise the needs of the most vulnerable populations? Okay, Ooh, those, are two, those are big questions. They're similar, but they're really big. Let me, the injustice between, if I understood it, between, I'm guessing between communities of color or, or people or the different groups that, okay. Um, ooh, that's a big one. So back in the fall, I did a public conversation with um, a native woman, um, Woman Stand Shining, Pat McCabe, and we, we did it publicly. What we called it, you know, Black Nation, Red Nation, the conversation around decolonization reparations, which are also often placed as decolonization or reparations. It's that either or thinking which actually limits any other option, you know, what's emergent in that. Um, and we talked about, and, you know, looking at the intimacy of right relations and actually a reframing, right? So part of it is recognizing that injustices have happened to a lot of people, right? And that as a, somebody who self-identifies as African-American, that for somebody who identifies as indigenous in the broadest sense, and then more particular, depending on you know, how they locate themselves, um, that for, the, you know, for many of them, it's like they just want the land back. Like, really? <laughs> like, you know, reparations gets complicated in a conversation with a group of people who are like, really? It's about you know, Columbus. <laughs> we want the land back. How does that work? So for me, part of it is how do we get better at standing in the tension of those differences and having those conversations, right? You know, um, I often feel we get hung up on the outcome part and we skip over a lot of the work of building relationship and understanding about who we are. I often tell people, I said, I'm less interested on in whether or not you agree with me. I'm more interested in how we can mutually create a space that allows both of us to wholly show up and see what might come out of that. You know, that common thing that might come out of that, which doesn't, doesn't need all of me and all of you to be in perfect alignment with each other. It actually just needs us to have the capacity and the willingness to create a space and, and that make an intention so we can figure out, we may discover something about each other and where we're going that we didn't know before until we brought our, our differences together to see what that might maintain. And I think that time and energy and resources aren't often given to you know, people in these various different groups to work together because I'm gonna say this really gently, whiteness is often centered. So each of these groups are often in response to the whiteness. And I know whiteness is diverse. I'm just saying that's usually how it's set up, right? As opposed to what would happen if we had more spaces where we are also in conversations with each other, that that's happening. And I don't believe it's either or. Again, I think we have the capacity to actually do it all in various ways. The polarization, and I almost forgot the question because I kind of what was the polarization. Lenise, can you tell me that again? I forgot actually the. Sure. Um, so, given how polarized the country is right now, 
on sustainability oh. and some other things, how do we converse uh, productively about yes. um, those kinds of that issue? Yes, okay. Um, I, so I actually view the polarization differently because I am reminded, I was reminded, I know I keep saying Raul Peck because it really just, he just blew me out of the water, that we have always been polarized. That, that's, that's a myth, the idea that the polarization now is new. It is only unique in that it looks a particular way, but actually what's at the root has always been there. I think of the polarization, that recognition of what some folks are seeing as polarization is actually an opportunity. You know, what is it revealing? That has always been right in front of us. What I have great empathy for is for individuals um, particularly white individuals who are, who are thoughtful or to out there, who are genuinely surprised at this moment in a very particular way. The human part of me is has empathy for it because I'm going, wow, that must be something. I mean, this has been my whole life, but <laughs> you just, you, I mean, I can genuinely see that you weren't, you didn't know. And what that means, the weight of that you know, the others of us have been carrying that weight in various forms our whole life. We've been navigating and negotiating, ducking and weaving, blah, 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 blah. We got skills, right? <laughs> Bam. Even we still get hit upside the head, but we got skills. And I said, and the other, they're, they're like just, it's like a boulder just got slammed in their face and they're laying on the ground looking up going, what the hell happened? And I understand that. So there's something about, for me, how do, and it's not my job to fix it, but what I'm saying is, how do, uh, for those who that polarization is fairly new in terms of what it's revealed for them and how they show up, how do they get to build their capacity and how are they supported actually to do that work differently and not to fall back on the status quo? What does it mean to call out in order to call in? I'm all about the, the second half. After I've called you out, I'm calling you and the intention is always there. How do I meet you where you are? because I want you to meet me where I am. I've always wanted you to meet me where I am. Half the time you haven't seen me colorblind or whatever the thing is, or pull yourself up by your bootstraps or, you know, your privilege, you know, anti, you know, this is reverse racism. I mean, all the stuff, all the stuff, you know. Okay, you, you got a lot of work to do. I want to meet you where you are. So in part is like saying at the core, there is still common humanity. There's still that, you know, which doesn't mean all the other stuff I'm, is by the wayside. I've said, oh no, it's front and center. So that's what I want to think. What does that mean for people who occupy these spaces of surprise around the polarization and are dealing with what it has revealed, revealed for them in their own lives? An accounting of everything they've gotten and done and understood up to now suddenly being challenged. That's deep and important work to do. That is deep and important work. I want to support that 150%. You know, what does what does that take? Which means there's a great letting go that has to happen. It's a great letting go. Oh, I could keep going, but I should probably stay. <laughs> on that note, absolutely. I could too. This has been such a powerful mo moment uh, this morning. Uh, to your point, anytime I get a chance to be on a call with Lenise and share, share a spotlight or panel with uh, her is always a great moment for me. But Dr. Finney, I have been moved by this moment with you. Um, it has been, um, I got goosebumps <laughs> about all of the conversations you have, the difficulty of, about legacy and sharing your stories. And as a person who has three degrees in English, I love the fact you start with narrative and art <laughs> and the power of art to shape yeah. our understanding yeah. of um, those voices that haven't been included in these conversations. And um, just, just the way in which you frame so much. Um, I, I, like I said, I've taken so many notes that I will include in my conversations about being and I work and give you all the credit. Um, oh hell, it's, uh, it's a mutually shared, you know, yeah. this knowledge I've gotten most of it from somewhere else and just, you know, <laughs> just the way that I kind of put it together for myself in order to understand and show up in the world. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Well, we have appreciated that. I want to thank our audience for joining yeah. us uh, on what's been a beautiful journey um, and just uh, sitting back and watching us enjoy this. And I know that you have enjoyed this um, as well. So thank you for your questions and thank you for your participation. Um, and so we'll let 
uh, Lizzie or whoever's coming on to wrap us up and move us to the next part of the agenda. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Caldwell. Thank you, Dr. Stevenson. Thank you, all y'all. Thank you. That was really you. cathartic for me, too. Thank you.